Illinois Stories is brought to you by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and by the support of viewers like you. Thank you. Hello, welcome to Illinois Stories. I'm Mark McDonald in Greenville. You know, there was a time in America before radio and television when your typical middle-class American family man might belong to a secret lodge of some sort. Well, somebody had to develop the initiation rituals and invent the mechanisms for these rituals. Well, that's where the DeMolin Company came in, and that's where the DeMolin Museum comes in. John Goldsmith, I gotta admit, the name DeMolin didn't mean a thing to me. Um, but I have not steeped in the history of, of the grand lodges of the 1800s and the early 1900s. These, these fraternal organizations mm -hmm. where men would go to get away from their family, That's right. uh, to purchase insurance, you know, their life mm -hmm. insurance for their family, to go be with the guys, mm -hmm. you know, and, and uh, there was no television or radio or anything right. like that. So this was a, a real sort of a ritual for a lot of families, wasn't it? It served a purpose on a lot of different levels. As a social gathering, as you said, in a time where uh, choices for entertainment were limited, and as you, as you said, men were looking for a good excuse to get out of the house mm -hmm. for the night. But if they could get the life insurance policy to provide uh, that assurance for their family's needs in case something happened to them, that was a very tangible result of joining the lodge. Mm -hmm. So um, the other thing I think is interesting is from a social standpoint, the men that belong to a lodge might be the mayor, be the town, uh, one of the town attorneys, or it could just be a local shop owner or a local uh, laborer. So it was a social lever, leveler as well. As we look around behind mm -hmm. you, you have the most fascinating <laughs> exhibit here of products made by the DeMolin Company. Right. Now, the DeMolin Company is still in Greenville. That's correct. Now they make band uniforms, mm -hmm. but they got their start making these this paraphernalia mm -hmm. for these initiation rites for these lodges. And, and it's a hoot to see what they <laughs> put people through to join these, isn't it? <laughs> People come in and, and they give us a puzzled look when we explain what some of the devices do. And we often get asked the question, well, why did grown men do these things? <laughs> and then you have to go back and explain what we talked about, that it was a different time. People had a different sense of humor. They didn't take themselves as seriously as they do now. And that there was a very practical use for belonging to the lodges. But the fraternal lodge pieces, the initiation devices, or hazing, if we, we would call them that now, mm -hmm. that's the bread and butter of this museum. Um, the pieces are rare. Many of the men that belong to fraternal lodges now have no idea what these devices are. They've heard rumors about yeah. them or in their own folklore because these things haven't been used in 50, 60, 70 they years. They don't do that yeah. anymore. Exactly. What are you holding? Well, <laughs> this, that's a good question. What's funny is that this uh, particular lodge initiation device by DeMolins was their number one seller, and because of that, it shows up in the marketplace a lot. You might find it on eBay or Craigslist or at an mm -hmm. auction. And I always get a chuckle when I see one of these listed on eBay as a musical instrument. And I have to email the people and say, no, I don't think it's a musical instrument. It's called a spanker. And the man being initiated would be blindfolded, and they would bend him over, and they would spank him. And it fires a blank cartridge very loud. It does. It, it does It's indeed. already loud even without yeah, the cartridge. That's correct. And that scared the heck out of the guy, it, right? It certainly did. It, it hurt worse than just being spanked <laughs> because it scared you it so much. It hurt your pride more than yeah. anything, probably, yeah. yeah. Okay, yeah. let's start with a little tour about who DeMolin was sure. and a little bit more about his background. And okay. the first thing you see when you come in the museum mm -hmm. is up here on the wall, you see this mm -hmm. cutout of these three individuals. Mm -hmm. This area is on the DeMolin family, and Ed DeMolin, the gentleman up here on the upper right corner, <clears throat> was the founder of the factory. He was a local photographer and was a gadget guy. Uh, he loved tinkering and inventing, and whatever technology was popular at that time, he prided himself in being the first person in Greenville to have that. Mm -hmm. He was the first man in Greenville to own an automobile. He was the first business owner to have a telephone in his business. And in 1892, Ed DeMolin received his first patent, and it was for uh, an attachment to a camera that allowed him to do what they called then freak photography, which today would be considered uh, double exposure, so that he could take uh, the same uh, 
uh, individual. And, and one example we have is a picture of his younger brother, U.S. And he could have U.S. de Molin sitting and U.S. de Molin standing, and it looks like a mirror image, but mm -hmm. it's two. It was uh, photographs taken at two different times, and it's a seamless photo. It was really pretty uh, fascinating technology mm -hmm. for that time, and so Ed gained a lot of notoriety because of that, and that's what led to how they got into making things for the modern Woodman of America Lodge. I, I might just mention the other brothers. Uh, the younger brother was U.S. or Ulysses. Okay. And the now he's in the middle, right? That's, he's in the middle. Okay. And then the one on the left is Erastus or Rastamolin. The three brothers brought interesting characteristics, very defined characteristics to this factory. Ed DeMolin was the creative guy. He was the mm -hmm. idea man. He had this crazy sense of humor. U.S. DeMolin was more the businessman, the bean counter, the guy who could work the books and knew how to market this business. And while the older brother, Erastus, was the behind the scenes man. He had no interest in any attention. He was a family man and was happy to work back in the back with the guys and was very comfortable in that role. They each brought a strength to this factory and in those early days it was critical in developing their success. Okay, now the modern Woodman of America mm -hmm. you mentioned. Uh, the the later the later uh, version of that was the uh, Woodman of America, Woodman of the World, the, mm -hmm. the Woodman of the World, the Odd Fellows, mm -hmm. and then off, the later offshoots, the Eagles and the Elks and all these fraternal right. orders. Mm -hmm. They all had these initiation yes. rights, and and that's where really where where the money was in this right. deal, right? Because the right. Mullen Company was making these, mm -hmm. inventing actually, and holding these patents on a lot of these devices. There you go. Yes. Let's look at one sure. over here because this is fascinating. You've got you have an enormous collection of these, which your mother who worked at mm -hmm. the factory kept and got you started collecting. That's correct. My mom worked there for 50 years um, and over the years her work became her hobby. So I would say about 98% of what we have in the museum is from my mother's personal collection. And before she uh, passed away, we both agreed that someday we wanted to see a museum here in Greenville mm -hmm. because her passion was bringing these things back to Greenville where they were made. Um, so this is an example of one of the lodge initiation devices. <laughs> it's called the Lung Tester. And we need to think about the time that this was popular, this took place, around 1900, around the turn of the century. Mm -hmm. And tuberculosis and other illnesses were very much a concern and something that people were fearful of. So if you're going to belong to a fraternal order that sold a life insurance policy, mm -hmm. they would certainly want to make sure that you were healthy enough to belong to this lodge. That was the premise. So the man would blow into the mouthpiece to uh -huh. test his lung capacity, and once he did, he would have flour shot back in his face, <laughs> and it fired a blank cartridge. <laughs> and scare the heck out exactly. of him. Exactly. <laughs> and everybody else got a big chuckle out of it. <laughs> and of course, they all knew it was coming. Oh, sure And they, they had to act like, oh, they've never yep. seen this before, right. right? They still probably still have flour in their ears from the time <laughs> it hit them. <laughs> That's right. Okay, That's right. now here's one over here. This is called the lifting and spraying machine, and mm -hmm. this is a strength tester. The factory did... Um, <laughs> three different variations on strength testing devices. This was a patented piece as well. The way this worked is we're going to test your strength, see mm -hmm. if you're man enough to belong to our lodge. So the guy would pick up on the handles, and when yeah. he did, he would shoot water in his face, and it fired a blank cartridge. So it's a pretty, pretty simple device, yep. and it's a simple uh, practical joke almost, yeah. but uh, everybody enjoyed it. They got a kick out of it, and uh, what we tell our visitors to the museum, nine out of ten people that did this stuff, they had a great time that night watching somebody being spanked yeah. or have water shot in their face. The tenth was the person that was having this done to them. They probably didn't enjoy it as much, but at the end of the night, if they were voted into the lodge, guess what? They became one of the That's nine that enjoyed right. seeing the next guy get it. There you go. There you go. Now, you're going to demonstrate some of these for us here we today. We sure are. Mm -hmm. And those that we don't demonstrate, we're still going to get a chance to see how they sure. worked and, and get a chance to see what's in the museum. Mm -hmm. Th this is a lot of fun. Good. And I bet you have a lot of fun, don't you? We want a fun museum that people come and they see things that they've never seen before and that it's, it's a memorable experience for them. And when they leave, they'll share the story with others. Yeah. John. Riding the goat meant, <laughs> meant something to, to people who were in these lodges. I, I've heard it myself. I, mm -hmm. I don't really know what it means, but we're about to find out, aren't we? You are indeed. <laughs> uh, the DeMolin Company made me these, these mechanical goats, which some people have uh, called the forerunner of mechanical bulls that we would have found in Gillies and mm -hmm. places like mm -hmm. that in the 80s. But uh, the goats were part of the lodge initiation rites. 
and uh, a man was told that he would be riding a goat, would have no idea what was coming. <laughs> he would be blindfolded, placed on the top of one of these uh, monsters, and then pushed around the, the lodge floor. The DeMolin Company made so many of these in the early 1900s that locally they were nicknamed the Goat Factory. Is that right? So if you go back into the old issues of the Greenville newspaper from the early 1900s, it just refers to the Goat Factory all the time. <laughs> uh, we have two different styles in this area. By the way, the area that you're looking at where we have all the lodges initiation devices we nickname the corral which yeah. is fitting because we have well, the goats in here uh -huh. uh, we have the low down buck and we have the pra the uh, uh, bucking goat they had different names for the goats one of them was called the practical goat and we haven't <laughs> yet figured out what was practical about it there was a ferris wheel goat there was a rollicking mustang goat they had all of these very creative names but the bottom line was no matter how they were used, no matter how they were built or how many wheels it had, the end result was that somebody was going to end up on the floor <laughs> at the end of the ride. <laughs> and you're probably being pushed by a guy who's wearing some kind of outrageous yes. uh, outfit of some kind. That's correct. Right? Mm -hmm. Either a devil or mm -hmm. a, an inmate at a jail or something. Right. And, and these are... These are Steel. Steel. Mm hmm Okay. And uh, there's an interesting story that we'll share uh, in just a little bit about why some were steel and why some of them were real horns. Okay. Well, we've, we've also, you, you've, you've arranged to have a young lady here demonstrate yes. for us. Yep. So let's pretend she's being initiated <laughs> into the lodge, although they would never allow a female in those days. That's but she's correct. more about the size That's of what right. a normal man would have been. Right. In, in the 1890s or so. Right. This is Cheyenne, and she's agreed to be our goat rider Thanks, for Cheyenne. today. Okay. And uh, and you touched on a very important point: is that men at that time wore not the same size as they are now. They weighed less. They were probably shorter. And so Cheyenne would be fairly typical of the size mm -hmm. of a man that would have been initiated at the turn of the century. Um, I mentioned just a moment ago that there were steel horns right. and that there were real horns. This one has real horns. And there's a great story as a part of the Demolin folklore about that. In the early days, the factory imported these real horns from New Mexico. It was in the New Mexico territory at mm -hmm. that time. Well, one day, they got a railroad car full of goat horns that were delivered to the factory. The factory lo was located next to the railroad tracks for a reason. They needed to bring in raw materials and ship the final products out. That's the reason they built along the tracks. So this railroad car full of goat horns sat there. And I neglected to mention that it was a nice, hot, summer, <laughs> southern Illinois day. And these goat horns sat on that rail car all day long. Oh, yeah. And the wind shifted from the south, and it blew the odor to downtown Greenville. Mm -hmm. And uh, several of the Greenville businessmen were concerned about this horrific odor that had permeated the town, and they made a trip down to the factory and told the DeMolin brothers that they had better never do that again, or they would be chased out of town. <laughs> so at that point, they said, no more real goat horns, and they, so they started to cast their own there at the factory. I'll be doggone. Yeah. Okay, pressure. The pressure hit them. Okay, now you re recovered this guy, because yes. he was old. I mean, but yeah. he was falling apart, so you recovered Yeah, him, this huh? goat was probably around 1910, somewhere around there. Okay. And usually when you find these, the wool, uh, uh, is fairly worn and we wanted one as a demo model for demonstrations like we're going to do uh, today mm -hmm. and so we had new wool put on there and then these straps are new but everything else is original on there all the steel work and yeah. and this part of the stirrup on the wow. bottom so okay Cheyenne you're you're being initiated into the odd fellows tonight <laughs> okay okay, okay. Uh, what we have are the blindfolds to Mullins had their own patented blindfolds they're called hoodwinks because you're going to be hoodwinked and so we will place these on Cheyenne <laughs> hopefully comfortably place them on her and depending on how these were lifted up she could see red or she could see all the way through or, or nothing at all or nothing at all or, or you could look out of one eye but not the other that's right <laughs> so because i like cheyenne and would never do anything mean to her i'm going to go ahead and lift this up so she'll see oh, red okay. so, she'll so see at least red. she sees a little bit and doesn't become disoriented and fall off so okay. are you ready i'm ready okay, okay. all right we're going to place Cheyenne on here. And the, initi the person that's being initiated has no idea what riding no. the goat means. No. And in fact, is probably blindfolded yep. before they even see this instrument. That's correct. And th they would be, it would be set on the black setting so that they couldn't see through. Now, yeah. she's got yeah. the red setting. So yeah. what she sees is a red, rosy colored world right now. <laughs> Cheyenne, are you ready? I'm ready. All right. <laughs> and are you holding the horns? I am now. OK. <laughs> and here we go. 
the way the mechanism is built with the wheels, uh, it gives a wobbly ride. If we were pushing this a little faster, a little harder, she would be swaying more. It might right. possibly be laying on the floor at this point. And you could even bounce her up and down, couldn't you? I or could you probably like this. would. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Well, she got an easy ride. She got it easy. She did. The, the, initi the real initiatee would have been on the floor by now. Yes. Yeah, okay. Yep. Thanks, Cheyenne. <laughs> <laughs> well, John, Ed DeMolin uh, had what was a photographer, built cameras, mm -hmm. had a patent for that freaky photography freak that you were, freak photography that you were talking about. Mm -hmm. And again, here's one of the tricks mm -hmm. that he, they would play on one of the initiatives. Right. Well, it would make sense for Ed being a photographer that a camera would be incorporated in some way into a lodge proceedings. Mm -hmm. And so we have this piece. This is one of the latest additions to our collection at the DeMolin Museum. It was purchased from um, a woman that found it in an old lodge building in Salter, South Carolina, uh -huh. which they say is not even quite a blip on the map. It's that small. And uh, we've done a little bit of restoration to it, but we're excited to have it as part of the collection. I've got my friend Randy Alderman here today day and he's uh, agreed to be our uh, lodge candidate to show what would happen and so the candidate was told that before you learn all of our secret signs and insignia and the secret work that we do we need to take your picture and include that in our record. It's reasonable. And, and sure it's a very reasonable request so they would uh, take a look in here. You got a viewfinder in they there. They got a viewfinder They would make sure that everything mm -hmm. looks good mm -hmm. and they would told the, tell the candidate to sit still for just a moment while they had their picture taken. <laughs> and they would get squirted with water. Brandy's a good sport. Brandy's a very good sport. <laughs> As you can see, that's a pretty good stream of water that comes out it of the sure camera. Is, and you're pretty good aim, too. We've had some practicing. Now, that's a real lodge chair. In real yeah. life, that chair probably would have collapsed, right? Well, the, <laughs> that particular uh, lodge chair is a real piece of furniture. Yeah. But you raise a good point, and that the Demolins did encourage the lodges to use the trick camera with their surprise chair. And the surprise chair had a chain underneath of it. When you pulled it, the entire chair fell back, and you were looking straight up in the ceiling. So you get a shot of water, and then you would fall back. Oh. And so they often sold those pieces together. As I said, we're excited to have this in our collection now. It's a very rare lodge initiation device. Yes, and the most is. important part is it works. Mm -hmm. And we will be using it on, <laughs> on unsuspecting victims. And these are kind of things that we love to share with the kids that come in for school tours because they get a kick out of things like this. You bet. <laughs> John, the kids like to come in here and spin this wheel, and this is an example of, of the items that you have in here, and where it stops, they can go ahead and start looking for, for what they want to see. I, I've stopped it on the, uh, on the lung machine, which one of the first things that right. we saw, right? Okay, and that gives you a start. And then we, uh, we also saw the goat. Mm -hmm. There's the bucking goat. Um, we saw a chair, not the collapsing chair, but we saw a lodge mm -hmm. chair. And oh, there's the, there's the, <laughs> there's the spraying camera. Okay, we saw that. And this is an interesting one. This looks horrifying. This looks like a, uh, an executioner. It does indeed, and DeMolins made their own guillotine. And if you think about it, it does make sense. Uh, the DeMolins were of French descent. Their father uh, was an immigrant from France, and the guillotine was a uh, um, it, device that was originally invented by the French. So the DeMolins said, well, why should we have our own guillotine for lodge mm -hmm. initiation? And it is pretty intimidating, mm -hmm. as in, we'll see. In fact, you, you, yeah. you have one. And, and it is because, well, we can see that. We can mm -hmm. see the, the garb right now that mm -hmm. the executioner is wearing. The, the, the victim, the, the guy who's being initiated, would lay down here with his feet out here and his head in that indentation. Looking up. Looking up. That's correct. Oh. Um, a couple of things about the guillotine. It was uh, not one of their most popular sellers, and you'll see why in just a moment. But one thing I, I want to mention is that the Mullins were very good at knowing how to sell accessories for whatever it was that they made. So with the guillotine, they also sold the executioner's robe. Mm -hmm. They would sell the fake beard and the hat. Uh, they sold paper mache heads that you could put in a basket next to this for effect. Ooh. And they also sold what they called a blood splattered cloth. Oh. And the cloth was just a piece of canvas that they took a red paint on a brush and splattered on there and they oh. sold that for effect so that the poor soul that was being told that you're being punished for a crime against the lodge and we don't believe that you can be trusted to leave here without sharing our secrets is strapped in and the executioner then would lift the rope and as it came down 
It stops there. But also as it comes down, it would fire a blank cartridge. So you, you really believe your head was chopped off? Yep. <laughs> but the safety mechanism is such that it would never go any farther than that. This is a piece of wood that's wrapped in tin. It's still kind of sharp down there. It would do the job. It's got the DeMolin uh, label on there. Mm -hmm. DeMolin's tagged almost everything that they ever made, so it makes it easy to identify. Mm -hmm. Now, a couple of things about the guillotine. As I said, it was not a popular seller, and you can see why. Well, it's a little too macabre. Right. I mean, it really scares the heck out of people. Um, the story that I've been told is that in the 1920s, they sold one of these guillotines to a uh, fraternal lodge in East St. Louis. And about a week later, it came shipped back to the factory with a letter saying, can we please have our money back? This thing is too frightening. No one will get close to it. Um, now, a couple other things that's interesting about the guillotine. Um, this is our most popular piece in the museum with kids. Whenever kids come in for a school tour, they literally line up and they all want their photos taken lying in this thing. Mm -hmm. We never use this or demonstrate it when someone is on the floor yeah. in the guillotine yeah. uh, it, because it is a little too scary. But when the kids come in, they love it. And we have many, many, many photos of this in this museum of kids laying in this. Mm -hmm. And probably my favorite shot, we're open for Halloween. And we've got a picture of a little girl dressed as a vampire laying in this thing. And it's oh. a great picture. <laughs> uh, how rare is this? There are only three of these that I know of that are in existence. There's the one that we have here at the DeMolin Museum. Yeah. Um, there's one in a private collection in Texas. And then the magician David Copperfield has one because he collects fraternal lodge initiation he pieces. Does. He does indeed. Wow. And so he has one of these. Well, maybe he'll, you know, collect too many and you'll be the beneficiary <laughs> of, of some of his overflow. Wouldn't that be great? That would be nice. Yeah. That yeah. would be nice. You know, John, we love the gags, but mm -hmm. the clothing is was probably as important as anything. Plus, it's what the company developed into was making clothing. That's very true. This is a, a modern Woodman of America outfit, and believe it or not, this was made in 1905. This is something that we've added over the winter, and we haven't even put out on display it's yet. It's cool. I mean, it, it would be very fashionable yeah, these it's, days. It's, it's a style. Kind of neat. Yeah. Uh, this was found in a lodge in Nebraska, and it's just a great piece, and uh, we're happy to have it as part of our collection. Yeah. And then behind it, we have this outfit which was made for the Improved Order of Red Men, I-O-R-M. And it was a lodge where the individual um, chapters adopted a specific Indian tribe and they wore um, outfits that would have been similar to what the Indian mm -hmm. tribe wore. So DeMolins made a variety of these Indian uh, Native American outfits. And this was from probably the 19-teens, 1915, uh -huh. maybe 1920. And uh, this was purchased from someone in California. It had been in the family for many, many years. And it's just incredible condition. And again, we're thrilled at having it here at the museum as part of the DeMolin collection. I I'll bet you there are closets all over the country mm -hmm. that have these things in them and people don't even know what the heck that was. Right. But it was dad's, we can't get rid of it. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Or it's, they don't know what it is or what to do with it and yeah. that's where we come in. So we hope that many of those things will find a home back yeah. here in Greenville. This would be a great place for them. Yeah. Let's look behind you here. If sure. We put that down. Uh, and these are great examples of some of the things that throughout the years, um, this one this one appeals to me because everybody's heard of the Odd Fellows, yeah. and this is what they wore. This is an Odd Fellows outfit. It has the Odd Fellows uh, symbolism, the all-seeing uh, eye, and the, the uh, link of chain, which is part of the Odd Fellows belief. Mm -hmm. um, this outfit, we have no idea what in particular <laughs> lodge it came from. It's very unusual, uh -huh. uh, but uh, it uh, makes for a good display. This is another improved order of Red Men outfit. And I don't like it as much as the one we saw earlier. It's a little more basic, yeah. but it is colorful, and uh, it's a popular yeah. piece on our display. And then behind you, uh, past you here, this is what the company has sort of evolved into. Right. They now make band uniforms. The company began making the band uniforms in, uh, in 1897. The first ones were made for the Greenville Municipal Band. And by the 1920s, they realized that this was where their future was. It's, it was the bulk of their business mm -hmm. because there were municipal bands, military bands. They even did circus bands and, um, and later high school bands as well. So we have an outfit like this, very basic from the 1920s through uh, the late 60s, the 80s. And then the one mm -hmm. uh, for Corpus Christi, Texas, was made about two years ago. Mm -hmm. And you can see the evolution in styles and colors and how they become flashier over the years. Mm -hmm. 
they are uh, in business today. Uh, they still make band uniforms, and they are one of the uh, world's leading manufacturer band uniforms. Quick story, their most famous project in recent years was for this year's Super Bowl. If you remember during the Super Bowl halftime show, uh, Madonna had yeah. a marching band. DeMolins made the marching band uniforms huh. for those uh, kids. And the outfit, the, the band uniform that CeeLo Green, uh, the singer, wore, yeah. also made by DeMolins. I'll be darned. Okay, John, I'm, I'm, I'm hoodwinked and I can't see a thing. <laughs> you, you put so a I lot feel, of trust in my hands I, right now. I, I really am. I really am. I, I feel like I feel like this is my first night at at the uh, at the lodge. Mm -hmm. So what what happens next? Well, we're going to brand you, and the Demolins had their own branding iron, and what the initiate was told, and I'll read this directly out of the book. It said, before giving any of you the secret work, you must be branded with the insignia of our order. Mm -hmm. It is the custom of this society to brand each candidate so he can be identified if found dead. That's, that's, <laughs> oh, the, that's the premise. So Aww. they would get a uh, real branding iron mm -hmm. and they would heat it up in the fire. And yeah. I'm holding the real branding iron in my hand right now. Mm -hmm. And uh, the viewers can see that this had a lot of damage to it from over the years from being heated up. And they might wiggle it under the person's nose because you could feel and smell that heat. So you're expecting to get the branding mm -hmm. iron. My uh, assistant Joe here then is going to help me in giving you the brand. Ah! <laughs> Gee, I want the brand. Please. This is the DeMolin electric branding iron. Did you feel it? <laughs> Did I feel it? I don't have any hair on my arm. This is the DeMolin electric branding iron. It was the old switcheroo. You would expect to be getting the this branding iron, yeah, and they please. would use the one that was hooked up to the magneto. I don't want to join this club. <laughs> and, and just think that at the real lodge meeting, they would have lifted your shirt and give you this on your back, and where it was very sensitive. So you got just a small taste lucky, of it. Huh? Yes, you did. Wow. You get lucky too at the at the Namolan Museum where they're open Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. The hours vary day to day, but you can go to their website and you can find out uh, what those hours are. And if you want to bring a group in, you can call ahead and make an appointment. With another Illinois story in Greenville, I'm Mark McDonald. Thanks for watching. Illinois Stories is brought to you by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and by the support of viewers like you. Thank you. For a DVD copy of the program you've just seen, send 1995 to Network Knowledge, P.O. Box 6248, Springfield, Illinois 62708. Be sure to include the program name, subject, and when the program aired. You can also order with your credit card by calling 800-232-3605.